uh, team Daycare Con for inviting and uh, thank you Dr. Bansi Sabu for giving this topic which was very interesting. I think it really deserved the place in the UDF symposium because it has best of both worlds. Now my topic is are we missing evidence based practice and I have added in diabetes because this symposium is about diabetes. So are we missing evidence based practice in diabetes. Now what is evidence based medicine. It is process of integrating individual clinical expertise and the best available clinical evidence from the systematic research. So it aims to increase the use of high quality clinical research in clinical decision making. So it is not a cookbook recipe but it has good application and it brings a cost effective and better health care. There are three main components of uh, evidence based medicine. First of all of course physician. So the training and the clinical experience of the physician, current expertise and continued learning. We all know we are here for our continued learning and that is what is important part of evidence based medicine. Along with it the information which is clinically relevant proven by research and best scientific evidence that we have. On top of it the priority of any medicine is the patient. So the patient's value, concerns, preferences, expectations and life predicament. These are the important, important components of the evidence based medicine. The five steps to practice EBM is first a patient focused and problem oriented clinical question. Then find the best evidence by the literary research. Evaluate the evidence for quality and usefulness. Apply the evidence along with experience and patient values and then evaluate the outcome, the information, intervention and the ev uh, evidence based medicine process. So finally you start applying, think uh, logically, then look for the literature support and then evaluate the outcome. These are the basic steps of evidence based medicine and it has helped us to uh, develop several meta uh, systemic reviews and meta analysis. The methods by which researchers identify multiple studies on a topic separate the best ones and then critically analyze them to come up with the summary of best available options. So this is increasingly incorporated into daily medical practices to overcome the shortcomings that we have been having traditionally. So though we are treating certain diseases in a certain aspect, there are certain shortcomings which we need to uh, overcome. Now if we consider managing type 2 diabetes, we have guidelines which come up every year. It is from national as well as international organizations like ADA, EASD, NICE, uh, that's for UK guidelines, Canadian guidelines, RSSDI guidelines. So these guidelines come up every year and the progress is that initially it was a stepwise approach but now it has become a proactive approach. So we need to have a proactive approach in managing diabetic patients. Now as we know last two to three de decades have sh uh, seen lot of evolution in management of diabetes because there are newer uh, molecules which has come up because we have increased the understanding of the pathophysiology of diabetes. So we have large basket initially as Dr. Vinay was saying we had only three drugs when we were studying in Nair insulin, metformin and SU. But today we have so many drugs like sulfonylurea, glinides, insulin, TZDs, biguanides, SGLT2, DLP, uh, DPP4, GLP1. So we are spoiled for choices and how do we choose. Now each drug has a different mechanism of action. The target site is different. So we have drugs acting on liver like TZD or biguanide, so drugs which improve the insulin secretion or drug which improve the peripheral sensitivity and again the uh, incretin inhibitor. So these are various uh, aspects or pathophysiology of the uh, uh, drugs which we, uh, they act on different pathophysiological sites. So managing hyperglycemia is not about correcting A1C, it is using the drug which is going to target the pathophysiology as well as prevent the progressive beta cell failure. This is what is important. It is not only a good glycemic control. We want to have a pathophysiological control of the disease also. Now as we all know all the guidelines like uh, EASD, ADA, AS, IDF, everyone recommends metformin as first drug of choice till date. But as we know things change and what is the current update? This is the current ADA 2022 guidelines and what does it say? The first line therapy depends on comorbidities 
as well as patient centered treatment factor so these are very important aspects uh, it, we have to consider cost accessibility and the management needs after that maybe metformin and comprehensive lifestyle may be the first choice but depending on other comorbidities we can use other agents as first choice what comorbidities of course i'm going to de uh, discuss a little bit in detail and it also suggests that we need to avoid therapeutic inertia it is very important that we assess the patient at every 3 to 6 months and avoid the burden of uh, unwanted hyperglycemia so as i said metformin and lifestyle may be first choice but depending on the comorbidities so if the patient is having uh, ascvd or heart failure or ckd with or without albuminuria you can use sglt2 inhibitor or dp uh, or, or glp1 receptor agonist so if ascvd pre predominance you use glp1 receptor or sglt2 inhibitor with the proven benefit and after one agent if the patient is not controlled you can uh, use the other uh, agent from the different class so if the patient is already on glp1 you start on sglt2 still not controlled you can use a uh, basal insulin tzd or su similarly if the heart failure predominance you use sglt2 inhibitor with the evidence of reducing hf uh, that is heart failure and if the patient is still not on target you can use a glp1 or a dpp4 or basal insulin and su's then if there is a need to avoid hypoglycemia which is always there then you should use agents like dpp4 glp1 sglt2 or tzd and after using it if the patient is still not on target use drugs from the different class and still see if the patient is achieving the a1c target or no then the other priority is weight so we want to avoid weight gain and we want to uh, promote weight loss so the drugs will be either glp1 or sglt2 inhibitor we all know su's tzds and insulin may be associated with weight gain cost always a factor so if the cost is a factor and in patients without ascvd you can use uh, SUs or TS, uh, TZD and if the patient is about target again use the drug from the different class and after that you can use basal insulin or DPP4 or SGLT2 inhibitor which has a lowest acquisition cost. So when we are managing type 2 diabetes our priorities are very clear first the efficacy that is lowering A1C second safety that is hypoglycemia prevention. Along with that, if we have CVD prevention, we are more than happy. So we have trials with CVD prevention and that is GLP-1 receptor agonist like uh, leader and duration trials with Lira and Sema and SGLT-2 inhibitor trials like Empareg with Empa, Canvas with Cana and Declare with DAPA. So these are the trials which have shown C CVD prevention and CVD benefit. Again, if we focus further on the guidelines, it says that if the patient is not controlled on OHS and you decide to start injectable, first injectable therapy should be considered as a GLP-1 receptor agonist prior to insulin if the patient is not on GLP-1 or a DPP-4 inhibitor. After that, if the patient is still above target, you can use basal insulin and basal insulin of course you start once a day any uh, after the uh, initiation you can titrate if the patient is still not on control either add prandial you can use a split mix regimen or you can use a premix regimen and then if the patient still not on control intensify to basal bolus therapy so this is what guidelines recommend but along with it we have to understand that what is the entry level a1c that decides whether we start the patient on one drug two drug or three drugs so if the entry level a1c is less than 7.5 ideally you should start with monotherapy can be any of the agents that we discussed if the patient is uh, having a1c more than 7.5 you start with dual therapy so it can be met plus any of the other agent and if the patient is not controlled you further titrate up titrate to triple therapy and if the a1c entry level a1c is more than 9.5 used uh, or 9 you and if the patient has symptoms either you uh, if the patient has symptoms you start insulin if the patient is not symptomatic there or there is no catabolic signs then you can start with dual or uh, or triple therapy 
again a step wise increase whenever the patient is not on the target a1c the latest recommendation also is there on use of metformin in pre diabetes so according to ada standard of medical care metformin therapy for prevention of type 2 diabetes should be used especially in those with higher bmi more than 35 age less than 60 history of gdm and rising a1c despite the lifestyle intervention so guidelines are there in place and uh, we know everything still what is the ground reality ground reality is very different uh what are the percentage of people who receive the healthy advices by the doctor so if you consider advice to start or do exercise only 30% advice or treatment for smoking again almost 30% and advice or treatment to lose weight again 38% so because even though we promote the lifestyle changes are the first uh, uh, advice to be given but what therapeutic advice are we giving on that heading is very important so two third of the diabetics are left lost without the proper advice of lifestyle intervention or modification and therefore it uh, patient is left confused lost uncleared and disoriented about what we are talking and this is a uh, data the real world evidence where they have collected the data from uh, almost 1 lakh type 2 diabetic patients in us between 80 and uh, 18 and 80 years of age and they have said that the initial agent they have studied what is the initial agent of course as you can see over years from 2005 to 2016 that we have the data the use of metformin as a first line is increasing so guidelines are there but we need to see how are we able to implement so implementing and adhering to the guidelines is also very important and again this is a registry which have shown the use of second line agent and it was seen that uh, after metformin initially as you can see down from the uh, graph in 2005 sus were being used more and then again uh, uh, glitazones or tzds but after 2011 then the rosiglitazone ban came and then slowly the role of the use of tzd reduces and uh, sus are still being used so these registries provide us data or information to assess the change in treatment to assess whether we are implementing the guidelines and what is the change which we get by following the evidence based medicine again if we see uh, uses of different therapy we all know in our country especially with too many uh, followers of baba and ayurvedic therapy and homeopathic therapies so if the usage of anti diabetic therapies is assessed oed is almost 70% insulin only 13.6% and more than that 15.6% is use of herbal medicine so this is more than the use of insulin which is the basic treatment needed for diabetes so the commonly observed routine clinical practices and the faults that we have is improper monotherapy and dosage early or delay in initiation of second agent choosing inappropriate first choice and clinical inertia remember we need to hit early and hit hard and then when we are managing the goal is very important we have to have an individualized target ada suggests less than 7 a1c a suggests less than 6.5 again individualized depending on patient factors like age duration of diabetes life expectancy comorbid conditions risk of hypoglycemia patient motivation and adherence so we need to avoid hypo and go low as much as possible balance between the safety that is hypoglycemia prevention and a1c effect has to be maintained now what are the key factors which will influence the clinical practice decision it can be evidences from systemic reviews and meta analysis evidence from safety studies or large outcome trials evidence from personal experiences and case report Uh, clinical practice setting and evidences from rcts and real world evidence now what is real world evidence it is the data collected outside the control uh, constraint so rcts have a controlled environment whereas real world evidence is a, 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 a situation happening in normal practice and therefore rcts just show whether it can work and real world evidence will show does it work so we are very uh, we should also after having rcts we should uh, look into the real world evidence also as i said rcts tend to be closely monitored and tightly controlled whereas real world evidence have uh, are more variable and reflective of the everyday 
so it can uh, real world evidence may provide a different finding from the rcts why so because the study set settings are different the adherence may be different there is no placebo effect there are population settings may be different and there is a uh, lack of randomization so rcts and real world evidence sometimes may have different readings now which guideline will fit our situation is what we need to understand remember guideline is a tool and not a rule uh, individualize the glycemic goals depending on the situation of our country try to fill in the gap between the guideline recommendation and what we have been doing in clinical practice and evidence based guidelines are in place one has to implement it so learning evidence based medicine is like climbing a mountain to gain a better view one may not make it to the top and find the perfect answer but individuals will undoubtedly have a better vantage point than those who choose to stay at sea level so this is what ebm is going to tell us uh, it is the in ebm it is physicians duty to find the best and the most current information and apply it judiciously to the be benefit of the patient but if a practice is based exclusively on science and math it is not going to be effective because our patients are not robots or clones therefore we have to have a uh, space for human differences and personal preferences an important rule in evidence based medicine is it starts with the patient and ends with the patient so i would like to ask you all one question uh what is the basis of your medical practice uh whether training clinical experiences and consultation with other professionals convincing evidence may be non experimental from articles case reports product literature etc preferences of the patient and active search of rcts or systemic reviews or meta analysis so this is a self assessment question i am not going to judge but i am just going to tell you that if you are able to tick all four then congratulations you are practicing evidence based medicine and if not you need to practice or maybe attend more conferences meet more people and then start practicing ebm thank you